Let's start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for the great gifts that you have given us, our lives. Uh, remember, uh, today is the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, that we be people who promote life, that we be people of hope in the world, people of love. We pray for all those who come here to, to listen and support them in their lives. That they might come to a greater understanding of God's love for them, so that they too might have the happy lives that God desires for them. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I, uh, I grew up in Mountain View, so this isn't foreign territory to me. So I was just down the road here, and I was thinking I was driving over here. When I was a little kid, we would come over to Lagunita because there was plenty of water, and you could swim. So we had a good time riding our bicycles. It wasn't that far, and they used to have little sailboat, uh, sailboats and all kinds of things going on on, the, on Lagunita there. But I guess now the water's pretty low, and there's not much that's happening. But I've always enjoyed being around Stanford. Uh, because it, it was so close to my home, we were able to come and enjoy all the, the sporting events, the football games. I uh, came to all the basketball games, Clyde David, some people from the 1970s. Uh, Stanford track was a big thing for my father, so we came and uh, enjoyed Stanford track. So I'm happy to be here. It's like, like being in my own neighborhood, being with you. And we had also, uh, I went to St. Francis High School in Mountain View, so we had Stanford people come over and teach classes at times. And, and help us in various ways on the campus there. So we had a, a good relationship with the school. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it warms my heart to be with you and share a little bit tonight. So I'm a Jesuit. I don't know if you know what a Jesuit is, but it's a member of the Society of Jesus. And I have a little, a little uh, priest joke for you because there were three priests who went to visit a barber. And one was a Dominican. And so he went into the barber and the, the barber gave him a nice haircut and at the end, the barber said, Father, Father, no charge. There's, there's nothing to this for me. It's a free haircut. So the Dominican leaves, and the next day, the barber comes to his door, and he finds a little note and a little bag. And the note says, thank you for the haircut. By the way, I make rosaries, and this rosary is a gift for you. The next day, a Franciscan shows up. So the Franciscan gets his haircut, and the barber says, no charge, Father. It's free. I appreciate the work you do. Franciscan's quite happy. He leaves. Next day, he comes back. Writes a little note. There's a little bag. And in the bag, there is bird seed. The Franciscan writes, I noticed that you had a parakeet in your shop. This is seed for your bird. The third day, a Jesuit comes. So the Jesuit shows up. He gets a nice haircut. He's looking good. He doesn't cut his own hair. He has a barber cut it for him. And the barber says, hey, it's free. And the Jesuit says, thank you so much. The next day he comes back, and there standing in line with him are five other Jesuits. <laughs> That's the charism of the Society of Jesus. <laughs> we try to help ourselves as best we can. So tonight, I want to talk about happiness. I try to be a happy person. People say, why do you have a smile all the time? I try to share with them that every time I read Luke and many parts of the Psalms, it all, they always talk about joy. That if we know that we are a saved people, we should be a joyful pe uh, people. We should be able to smile at one another, to address e each other in kindness, to be helpful with each other, show charity. So the idea of tonight's uh, talk is basically a better understanding of why God wants our happiness, why God wants us to be joyful people. And I'm going to start the talk off by uh, mentioning this icon from Rublev, Andrei Rublev, whose uh, death date happens to be next Tuesday. I just looked it up on, on uh, one of the search engines. And it's on the 29th. Well, the icon's an interesting icon. And you have a copy in your hands if you want to look at that as well. But it's of the Trinity. And so you see Father, Son in the middle left to right, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they're, they're, they're seated together around what appears to be a table. In the back of the Father, what people describe as the home of Abraham, source of the covenant with Israel. And then behind our Lord, a tree, in recognition of the tree in the Garden of Eden and the tree of the cross. 
and then behind the Holy Spirit there, a mountain and a kind of ephemeral understanding of the purity of mountain heights, as we all know if we've hiked up a, a mountain top, in the cleanliness and the purity that we experience as part of the Holy Spirit. And if you notice, both the Son and the Holy Spirit have their heads slightly bowed to the Father, the source of creation. This uh, understanding of Trinity, three persons, one God. We have an icon chapel at the seminary, and sometimes I've gone in to pray before some of the icons to meditate, and if God is willing to contemplate. And I noticed something about this that was important to me, and I'm just going to give you a little second to, to look at it and, and try to uh, address what is the icon asking you to do? What is the icon presenting to you? What caught my attention when I was praying before it was there's a table with a fourth spot. And so me and you and all of us are being drawn into the Trinity, are, to, are being drawn into God, who's love itself. So this is a great, a great hopefulness, because it's saying we are made in the image of God, and we, be, we can become one with God. God is there for us. Some commentators suggest that the table itself is the Ark of the Covenant, the commandments, God's presence, and Jesus pointing to the ark, ultimately pointing to the temporal experience of being Emmanuel among us. So the icon is a representation of love, at least in my own meditation and contemplation. This is who God is. So I want to read Psalm 4 to you, and I think I've asked you to, to look it over prior to this lecture, but just listen now and Listen to what the psalm tells us. God, guardian of my rights, you answer when I call. When I am in trouble, you come to my relief. Now be good to me and hear my prayer. You men, why shut your heart so long, loving delusions, chasing after lies? Know this, Yahweh works wonders for those he loves. Yahweh hears me when I call to him. Tremble, give up sinning. Spend your night in quiet meditation. Offer sacrifice in a right spirit and trust Yahweh. Who will give us sight of happiness? Who will give us sight of happiness? Many say, show us the light of your face turned toward us. Yahweh, you have given more joy to my heart. There's that word joy. More joy to my heart than others ever knew for all their corn and wine. In peace I lie down and fall asleep at once, since you alone, Yahweh, make me rest secure. If we're invited into the Trinity, we can have the peace and joy and happiness that God wants of us. That's what God offers us. Gratuitous, gratuitousness, freely given, love that pours out, pours forth. And what is the response of someone who is loved and recognizes that love? It's love and response. In fact, it's a sense of responsibility how we live our lives, what we say, what we do, how we interact with one another in our human experiences. So that leads me now to my little diagram here. And I take this from Holy Father John Paul II's Theology of the Body. And it's a simple diagram, but help, helps us understand how love is a part of our experience in our humanity. And so at the top of the diagram, I've put Trinitarian love, what we've just uh, reflected on in terms of Rublev, Trinitarian love. In the left-hand corner here, to love is to give oneself to another. 
to give oneself. Just for a moment, think about that. If I love someone, do I want what is good for that person? Yes. Do I want that person's happiness? Yes. Do I hurt when that person hurts? Yes. Will I sacrifice for that person? Yes. All these elements of love, to give oneself to another person, isn't that what God does to us or for us? And then to the right there, what John Paul II calls the paradigm, the paradigm of Trinitarian love in the world, spousal love the love between a man and a woman, and what that means in the giving of one to the other. Now, there are many ways. I mean, in celibacy, you can live spousal love. The priest is in persona Christe, comes to you offering the sacraments, providing the counsel, the support, the guidance, as I do as a spiritual director with the seminarians, so that they may have happy and good lives. So in, a, in, a, in effect, you are my bride. They are my bride. And so we give to each other in that way. This is the power of our Christian message, that through the Trinity, through the example of Jesus Christ, we have an experience of what love is. And because of that, we can love one another. Individually, in our interior spiritual life, we love God, we love others. And in our exterior behavior, our deeds in our words, how we interact with one another. So the diagram is just a simple example of what this Trinity example is for us in our faith tradition. Now, just in passing, just one little comment on concupiscence, because some people hear concupiscence and they immediately think of sins of sexuality. Concupiscence means using another or something for your own purposes. So it's a self-centeredness well, rather than a centeredness on the other. And if we are to be uh, disciples and sons and daughters of God, our, 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 our look, our direction is always to the other. And in fact, that's where we will find our ultimate happiness, our ultimate happiness. Now, Aquinas uh, borrows from Aristotle. Aristotle says, what is it that we all desire? We desire happiness. We want what's good in life, in our own experience and in the experience of others around us. I sometimes help at uh, the Redwood City Jail and just to visit and offer the sacraments. And in the past, much more often at the San Francisco uh, San Bruno facility. And I get to know the men and their lives and their histories. And what is it that they all wanted? They wanted happiness. But what they chose, what they thought would lead them happiness, actually led them to hurt and pain, not only in their, in their lives, but in the lives of others. There's a distinction between the joy and the peace and the bliss that one receives in knowing God and simple pleasures that are momentary and passing. This is also fundamental to our understanding of our faith. So that brings me to the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are also on your sheet on the reverse side. Well, I skipped over the, the Ten Commandments. Obviously, a source of our knowledge of what is good and right given to God's chosen people. How do I look at the Ten Commandments? There's a growth in our understanding of who God is. And so the T Ten Commandments serve us. We have a, a chart, a form of understanding of what is good and right. They should lead us to the Beatitudes, which are interesting in what they express. So briefly, we'll just go through some of them here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How could that be? Well, a person, and ultimately we all find this out in our lives, our mortality will ultimately uh, be that uh, underlying uh, understanding of that, is that we can't save ourselves. We need to be saved. And so that 
willingness to surrender. Some people talk about it in the 12-step programs of uh, Gamblers Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous of surrendering to a higher power. That is simply something for people who are non-Christian, who have heard Christ talk too much and have been turned off about it, to find that they can't save themselves. They need to surrender. And so for us as, as Christians, that's surrendering to Christ. It's surrendering to the Trinitarian God who is love and realizing that I can't save myself no matter how I try. In the end, all of us are incapable of doing that. We are dependent on a loving God. So blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Because they realize that. And also blessed are the poor in spirit because it doesn't depend on social class. Because sometimes poor people don't surrender themselves. Wealth is not a bad thing. But wealth understood as a gift from God and still allowing myself to recognize that and surrender to God is a good thing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall, be, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice me glad. This is pretty counterintuitive, isn't it? It sounds like I'm going to have to sacrifice a bit. That it sounds like to really know who God is, there will be a t times when my happiness or my momentary pleasure is... is um, set aside for my ultimate happiness because I'm willing to sacrifice. Think of the word sacrifice. It's something that is sacred. Spouses sacrifice for each other. Families sacrifice for those who are weak within their families. Uh, friends sacrifice for friends. In fact, that's where Aquinas picks up this idea of love and friendship because in the Nicomachean Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle, he talks of friendship. Who is my friend? The one I will sacrifice for, the one I will give time to, the one that when happiness happens for that person, I'm happy. All these sorts of things are who a true friend is. Remember spousal love. Ultimately, that's the parad paradigm of love for John Paul too of Trinitarian love within our, within our world, within our community. So sacrifice is an important part of this. And for that reason, I, used to, I like to talk about Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump, and I think some of you have probably seen Forrest Gump, the movie. It's on television constantly if you have cable television. Rerun, rerun, rerun. Forrest Gump had a relationship with Dan the Lieutenant, with Jenny, you remember his friend Jenny had a relationship with his mother, obviously, and a relationship with Bubba, who Bubba said, we're best friends. You're my good best friend, aren't you, aren't you, aren't you Forrest? So there's this idea of where the identity of one is melded with the identity of the other. Isn't that what we have with three persons and one God? Isn't that what we have in our understanding of entering Trinitarian love? So you might remember the scene, and this sticks in my mind, of Forrest in Vietnam. And there's an attack that's happening, and Forrest's platoon is under fire. People are being wounded, and Forrest goes back, runs back into the fire, and saves them one by one. And the last person he goes back for is Bubba, my best friend. And if you remember the close of that scene, Bubba and Forrest are there at a waterside, shoreside. And Forrest has Bubba in his arms. And he's looking down at him. And if you can remember the image, think of Michelangelo's Pieta. That's what it is. The friendship of Mary and Jesus. 
the depth of that love that when another has hurt, I have hurt. And so Forrest realizes that Baba is his best friend. And like the Pieta, it's a sign of the love that Baba has for him, my best friend. This is the melding that we're asked to live. Now Aristotle says, and Aquinas picks up on this, we can't love at that depth across humanity. God can. Normally, it's the people that we encounter, our families, perhaps the person with whom we fall in love. And from that, hopefully, the love grows. And we can, like concentric circles, love more and more, love your neighbor as yourself in a wider and wider circle. That is what's going to give you ultimate happiness. It's a little paradoxical to think about those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who mourn shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. But all of these positions of surrender to God are ones that bring us more and more into the Trinitarian love that we seek. The Beatitudes. And for that reason, I, I mentioned to, to, to Father Isaiah that the Dominican Servus Pincares, who I've used for this little talk in moral theology, you know, not my examples and some of the presentation, but he says the, the Beatitudes are the, cha are the charter for Christian living. If you want to understand how to be a disciple of Christ, live the Beatitudes, read the Beatitudes. Stupid is as stupid does. Happy is as happy does. Blessed is as blessed does. The ontological is comes from the living out in action what the truth of the, of the gospel tells us, the word of God, logos. So with the Beatitudes are a source of strength and guidance. And in terms of moral theology, I would say that they point to what it is that we should, should do to live a happy life. Rejoice and be glad. Another example I'll use Isaiah, how are we doing with time? I need to give me, when I get close to 10 minutes, you just let me know. Okay. Um, hmm, I just lost my thought, my thought right there. It'll come back to me. So the Beatitudes are those sources of happiness that we long for and that we will live out if we truly follow Christ in discipleship. And Pinkera says, again, that's the charter. That's the matura maturation and growth in who we are as sons and daughters of God, knowing how it is to love. Now, God loves infinitely. We're open to loving infinitely. God needs nothing. If we want to live in the image of God, do I need a lot of things? God needs nothing. God is all loving. Can I be open to others? All these ways of, or characteristics of God, I take on in my spiritual journey, my interior life, so that I become more and more open to loving as God loves. How do we build on that? The virtues. If you look at your sheet there, we grow in faith and hope and love. Faith is interesting because if I have faith, I will act. Faith without works is dead. But with faith, in my understanding, we have hope and love. We share with others. And how do we go about sharing? Prudently, in justice, with courage, and fortitude, and temperance. And Aquinas says that all those are supported by charity, which is love. So I love prudently in my discernment of what is right and wrong, what is good for me, what is good for other people. I love injustice so that in how I serve people, I'm able to do it in a way of mercy and kindness. I love in fortitude. I love in knowledge. I'm sorry, I love in temperance and how I judge what I need and what I don't need. I use one quick example of Viktor Franco, the, uh, the person who came up with the idea of logotherapy, who was in a con concentra concentration, concentration camp in Germany where his wife died. And he looked at who were the people that were able to, to continue on. And there were people that either had some work, some 
something that they wanted to finish and complete in their lives, or they were people that still had loved ones that they were concerned about, the idea of love, and wanted to be available to and support in their lives. Or finally, and this is where it resonates with our Christian tradition, they found suffering, or they found meaning in the suffering itself. That in the blessedness of all this, the mourning and all that might happen, because they carried on, they could find meaning and fulfillment as well. An example of a person who is not a Christian, not a Catholic, who says that love can be found in the darkest moment, in that dark night of the soul. And so we know in our tradition, the sign of the cross is one of self-giving, that ultimate uh, desire to love to one's end, giving up one's life itself. So we have those virtues, faith, hope, love, prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance. Habits, the practicing of those, then lead to a greater peace, a greater joy in our lives. And then the gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, the grace that happens through the sacraments, through our prayer life, through God's free giving, so that we might be people who have knowledge of who God is and what is uh, God's design in the world. Piety, a filial uh, respect for who God is. Fear of the Lord basically means reverence, respecting who my, who my creator is. And then the gift, um, and then the uh, fruits of the Holy Spirit, charity, chastity, faithfulness, goodness. And as a spiritual director, I offer this to you because our spiritual life leads to our moral life. If I look along this list of fruits of the Holy Spirit, can I say that that's part of my experience? Can I say that I am a person of generosity, a person of gentleness, a person of patience or kindness? Do I have peace in my life? Is there joy, modesty, self-control? If I can say, checking off some of those characteristics, I can say that I'm in good standing that yes, the Holy Spirit is at work in my life because those characteristics are signs, scriptural signs of what it means to be melded and in relationship to God. So what do we do in our daily lives? Aquinas tells us do good and avoid evil. A simple statement, but hard to live. We are imbued by grace through faith, hope, and love. We have what Aquinas talks about as eternal law and divine law, God's design, the Ten Commandments, Revelation, the Scripture, and all those ways of understanding God's will. And then we have what we are given in nature, our justice, our prudence, our temperance. And by natural law, we come to an understanding by our reason of what is correct and good. Now, what happened in probably the, uh, I guess, the early... 14th century is something that was called nominalism that Pinker suggests is one of the issues that we face in our Christianity is that in this nominalism there was a, uh, a denial of universals or, or a general understanding of abstract concepts that people might be able to understand as true across our humanity in every way. Self-preservation, for example, being one. Or procreation, which the church talks about as well as being another. And so with the development of nominalism, Pinker says there was a, a misguided attempt with manuals and other ways of addressing obligations in our Christian life, our duties, that became overly rigid and overly demanding that led people astray from what it was truly the goal, what was truly the goal of scripture and, and our discipleship is ultimately our happiness. So nominalism took us off course a little bit. And from that, there were manuals developed and uh, penance was given for various sins. And it was a kind of a root way of responding to life itself. But that's not what God wants from us. God wants our happiness. God wants what is good for us. And in that way, the habits that we develop through virtuous living, as I've gone through here, the, Deca the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes, the virtues, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, signs, 
of being on that right path. This is what God wants. Your joy, your happiness, and your relationships with one another, your relationship with your family, and your relationships with the wider community. It's, it's, it's our ultimate desire. And as you know, Aquinas says in the end, because as Christians, as Catholics, we look to the transcendent, in the end, it's eternal life and the happiness of being one with God. He calls it the beatific vision. Being one with God. Being God-like in God's presence. To see the face of God, as the psalm said, was the source of happiness. So this is what the call is. This is what the desire is for us in our lives. Uh, God's ultimate uh, goal is your happiness. Your happiness. I I think that's about all that I wanted to share with you. Um, I would say again in the Ten Commandments, there's a sense of moral devel development, ob obligation of teaching that goes on. Then there's an interiorization of the law, the sense of blessedness that comes from the Beatitudes. And finally, what St. Augustine tells us is love God and do what you will. To be a loving person is to do God's will. And so the discernment and the interiorization of all this that goes on, icon, sense of Trinitarian love, then becomes a part of who you are in your humanity. And that's where the fullness, the, the joy, and the peace that uh, we ultimately find is at the source. So I'm going to leave it at that. And then I'll, I'll take some questions about the icon or your reflections about your own happiness. And I know we're going to have some time in groups to kind of mull this over a little bit is about what this means, what God desires of us. Are we good for time? Any, any thoughts? Any, any wonderment? So you mentioned that um, Aquinas says that only God can love everyone, but for human beings, we're kind of limited, so there has to be some kind of order. But there seems to be a little bit of an injustice around that, in the sense that, like, what, how would you choose, like, as a human person, given you're limited, you always strive to be more... No, it's a good question. To, ...to open up, right? Right. But because of our limitations, we are forced to choose to give preferences to other people. How do you think about that? Yeah. It, it seems wrong. Yeah. But it's natural. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a natural challenge. Uh, uh, the, uh, the kingdom is now, but not yet. That the, we want to know that Jesus is here, and that kind of love is, is possible, but it's, quite, it's not quite there. What I have found, and I offer this because I've thought about this in terms of vocational life, is that your discernment is, is very important. So you are going to have times of choices between two goods. Which one is the one that is correct to choose? Well, ultimately, if God is a loving God, God wants what's good for you, you choose the one that God desires for you. So in prayer life, and as the church father suggests, in spiritual direction with a person who is uh, sensitive to what the church teaches and how people live their lives, uh, we're all limited by circumstances of one kind or another, come to a discernment about which of these two goods is in fact the one that brings the consolation and the peace and joy that allows me to know that it's God's will. If I'm conflicted, intense, and I haven't perhaps given it sufficient time to, to discern and to reflect upon the decision I need to make, then I need to do that. Sometimes we're in an immediate, I'm, I'm, I'm now uh, using St. Ignatius char uh, charism of spiritual direction. I'm in immediate need to make a decision. I make the best decision given all of my knowledge of what is occurring, my understanding of the church and what it teaches, and trust given my history that I'm doing the right thing. This is, uh, think of pre-Cana conferences, people getting married. One of the elements of a good discernment is, are we a compatible couple? Are we able to see the nature of sacrificial love that is good for the other person, that is loving as God wills. It requires some time. 
Another way is that people go into the desert, a retreat. So they take time out of their ordinary life to be reflective about where do my true, true desires lie and are those desires parallel to God's will in my life. So in vocationally, I tell people all the time, I kind of misunderstood this at an early age, and there are a lot of young people here. It's great, you're just starting out. Find God's will and you'll find, and you'll find your happiness. You can be a good scientist, you can be a good sociologist, you can be a good social worker, you can be a good teacher, you can be a good athletic coach. I think of uh, Coach Latiker over there at De La Salle High School, all those undefeated seasons, but how he's influenced the people that he's, he's coached. That's where you want to find your happiness and bliss, is knowing, given my talents, given my inclinations, uh, given my interior consolation, this is the path that God wills for me. Another easy one is marriage. Marriage, celibacy, religious life, whatever that might be. This is a good time to do that. It's a reflective time. You know, you're, in, you're in school, a lot of you, and uh, pursuing degrees and different professional fields. Where do I find my happiness in that? Aristotle says we find happiness in three ways, basically, or try to. He saw, it says in the sensual, you know, the material, possessions, wealth, these sorts of things. And he says that doesn't provide happiness. And then he says we try to find happiness in reputation. Mm. I'm love. People respect me. That's why they used to, now it's probably the Billionaires Club, but they used to call the Senate the Millionaires Club because you needed to be a millionaire to become a U.S. Senator. Now it's probably, I don't know, multimillionaire. Trillions. Chillionaire. Chillionaire. Okay. So people look for happiness. Aristotle says no. He says you find happiness in contemplation, the interior life. Think of the word contemplation within the temple, contemplative. So you can be very happy, what would be, in some people's minds, very simple and mundane activities. One example, I did a little paper about uh, St. Mary's Hospital up in San Francisco. And I asked the head of nursing, what maintains the Catholic identity of this hospital? You know, how can you call it Catholic? And she didn't say the human resource materials or the, uh, the CEO's uh, background. She said there was a Catholic nun who worked in the laundry room, but had completely dedicated herself to the mission of the hospital. And from the top person in the administration to the most lowly person in the hospital, they pointed to her and said, that's our Catholic identity, sacrificial love. She gave herself completely in what she was doing. People say, hey, she was folding sheets and cleaning dirty, cleaning dirty linen. But she did it with love. That's, that's, that's what makes all the difference. Powerful, powerful uh, witness of what love is, this Trinitarian love. Another question, real quick, because we've got to go in a couple minutes here. Help me out. Go ahead. What is this happiness? Uh, how do you, how does it, is it reconciled with uh, tragedy uh, illness and suffering, death. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is good too because no matter your vocation or no matter your state in life, married, single, whatever it might be, we are going to face challenges. That's the gift of our faith. So did Jesus. He faced the ultimate challenge of the cross and said yes to God's will, said yes to what God desired of him, and what was the result? Resurrection and the salvation of humanity. In tragedy, in suffering, if we look at those sorts of moments, because they will come, right? Now there's some gray heads in the room too. Will they not come? Will there be times of, of challenge in your life or difficulty, burdens, worry, preoccupation? If I do that, in relationship to my discipleship with Jesus Christ, even in that moment, I can be consoled. Think of St. Paul, shipwrecked, um, imprisoned, persecuted, ultimately crucified. And he said, the victory's been won. Christ 
He's my Savior. If we have that same attitude in this bliss, we have the happiness of St. Paul. And it'll carry you. It'll carry you through all kinds of moments of challenge in your life. There's, there's no question, no question. So blessed are, the, are, are those who mourn because they will be comforted. Another question real quick. I hope I'm, I'm, I'm giving a little bit of uh, yeah, fodder, okay? Last question. last question. A little bit of fodder for thought. I've always thought that the goodness fruit is kind of confusing. A little bit, so like goodness is kind of a vague word. Like, I'm not sure if it's like goodness is just kind of a vague term. So I just wanted to know if you had any, like, insight into Hmm, not right off. I'm trying to think of an example, maybe. Well, it's, let me, I would say it's a disposition. It's an inclination to, people in the secular world talk about optimism. I think we should talk about hope. So a person of goodness has that disposition of being on the sunny side of the street. Not in a kind of uh, uh, Pollyannish way but in a way of, I'm walking in discipleship with Jesus Christ. It may be a painful moment at times, but I know that, that God is there with me. And so I can live my life in a disposition of being good to others and also to myself. I want to include that in that as well. This is, this is not kind of a sacrificial experience where it's a masochistic way of looking at the world. No, that's not Christianity. It's inevitable that at times we'll face challenges. How do I move through those challenges in my Christian understanding is what's important. Okay, so that was the last question. That's it. Thank you.